excited, amen. Uh, I, I wanted to talk to you about a few different things tonight. I wanted to talk to you about Sunday a little bit. Uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to talk to you about the Word of God. I wanted to talk about the Word of God tonight. I wanted to talk about deliverance a little bit. It's a hot topic in the church today. Deliverance is a hot topic. And so at least those three things off the top of my head that I can think about. You know, I don't want to spend too much time on Sunday. I'm very grateful for Sunday. Boy, if you miss Sunday, you miss like, what did Jesus tell you? Israel? You missed your hour of visitation. <laughs> but uh, praise God. <laughs> you know, it, it was a it was a real blessing. I just want to say though about that. You know, really and truly, I mean, I'm not, not going to say that he didn't say anything that I wasn't aware of because that wouldn't be completely honest. Um, he said a lot that I wasn't really aware of, and one thing that I do know is is that it's going to all be God opening up heaven and pouring out His Spirit in yes. order to make all that happen. Amen. But but you know, it's, it, it, I can't say that the whole thing really completely surprised me. I, obviously, I was awestruck under the presence of God. I mean, we, I, if you couldn't tell, I was convulsing and trembling under the presence of the Lord. So I'm not trying to be winded. The whole thing was so supernatural and so miraculous and so powerful that it's like I don't, you know, it's just it was it was awesome. But but what I'm trying to say is this: is that one a couple of things that I did notice and I want to encourage y'all with is that. This was actually an answer to prayer, and maybe I'll be able to share a little bit of that real quick. Um, but just kind of hold that thought. But in reality, I need you to be—I need you to realize that the Holy Spirit's already been moving in our services, and I'm not. We need to understand that. As a matter of fact, this this man of God was taken aback. If you go back and you watch the video, he said, "Y'all are messing me all up because because he didn't expect the Spirit of God." Because I don't think that lately when he's been traveling, I'm not saying that the Spirit of God's not showing up in other countries and stuff like that. Because the Spirit of God does move in a lot of other countries. I've seen, I went with Gaudi to Tampico about three years ago. And I'm telling you right now, what, the, what that service looked like over there was basically like, a, like you know, one, some of our best services when people have been all at the altar and deliverances are just taking place. And, and people are getting filled with the Holy Spirit. Like, it's like that. It's like that all, most of the time. And people, this because people are hungry. And I do believe that what was hap been happening in our church is that we've been getting hungry. Hungry, amen. And I got to tell you that uh, I don't have, I think I have the book. I'm going to walk off stage just for a second because I think I left the book over here. <coughs> and um, one of the things that I did also notice is that so one of the things that started everything was prayer, right? <laughs> Going back a long time ago before Brenda and uh, brother uh, Kirk and sister Brenda ever showed up, we started praying. Some of us sometimes it was two, three people in the prayer room. And, uh, and then sometimes it was just me, and then the next thing you know, it's three or four. And then the next thing you know, it's almost like the day of Pentecost sometimes in there before church, definitely on Sunday mornings. So, and I mean, I'm, not, I'm, not just, I'm just not saying something, I'm telling you. You know, Aaron bought me this book uh, a long time ago. It was, it's called Ian Bounds, The Classic Collection on Prayer. And, it's, and he wrote this book in, back in the 1800s. People that know anything about the church know about this guy. They said he was one of the most powerful men of prayer. This whole book right here is nothing but talking about prayer, talking about prayer, prayer, prayer. Like he's got all these little one-liners in here. And he's like, church, the church is looking for a better preacher and God is looking for preachers that will pray. And you know what I'm saying? He's like, the Lord's not as worried about your sermon, about how much time you spend on your sermon. He's worried about how much time you spend on your knees. Hallelujah. The sermon's birthed in the prayer class, things like that. You know, it's just like, I'm just like, dude, now I'm eating it up. But I found the book the other day, and I was like, look, Aaron, you told me about this guy and whatever. And he's, he's like, yeah, man, I think that might, might be my book. I don't know. He said it like that. I said, I don't know, dude. I think you gave me this book, and I didn't know this card was in it. I just think this is so cool. Huh? Oh, it's from my mom. You from you? You bought me this book? Oh, nah, I ain't buying that. All right, well, I've marked it all up, sis. Where was it? <laughs> oh, well, how you know? How you like that? Well, I don't know, though. Were you, you were living with me in 2002? Nice. Uh-huh. 
Now, I remember you gave me an Ian Bounds book. But anyway, who cares? Cut this off the video. But anyway, well, it's all good. But it's, I, I don't think so. I think you got it for me. But that's okay. And I mean, I'm being legit, but that's all right. Y'all's memory is getting a little bit bad as y'all get old. So is mine. But look, I'm just talking. I'm going to pray for y'all. I'm going to pray for y'all's memory. <laughs> anyway, I, it's not, I'm not promoting the book. I am promoting the book. But what I'm really promoting is prayer. Prayer. Let me say that again. I'm really promoting prayer. I'm going to say it one more time. I'm promoting prayer. It's the, I believe it. I believe it. And that's one thing, whether or not Aaron gave me this book or he meant it for his mama, one thing that I've gotten from Aaron through the years is the importance of prayer. And there's been times that I'm like, yeah, I get it. But no, I'm telling you right now, there's something to prayer that unlocks heaven. That's it. That's indeed. It opens up the sky. Hallelujah. Let it pour down like rain. Yes. And what I want to try to tell you is this. It, 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 and listen, I am not just talking. And listen, I'm not being rude, but I'm going to just be me. Is that okay if I'm just me? Like, we're not talking about some little popcorn prayer, some out of court prayer. We're talking about entering into the presence of God. And listen, sometimes that takes time to even be able to develop the exercise of prayer like that. What I'm trying to say is, is that if we have not been tuned up in prayer, then sometimes we don't even feel it. And it's hard and it seems like drudgery and it seems like frustration. Like, oh man, it's prayer time again. No, listen, I can't tell you enough how important prayer is. I have said this before and I'm going to say it again as a pastor of the church, Amen. as a man who loved my children with everything that was in me. Okay, as a man that did the very best I knew to do to raise my children in the ways of God, as a man who understood the finished work of Christ, as a man who tried to teach my children grace and not law, I can without a doubt tell you, shamefacedly, blushed with shame, but I can tell you that I did not pray the way I should have prayed as a father. I'm not telling you I didn't pray for my children. I did pray for my children. Oh, I can tell you I'm praying a lot different for them nowadays. Hallelujah. And I'm believing that the Lord's going to deliver my babies and bring them back home. Amen. I'm, I'm believing that. But listen, you can't do, your children are still kind of young. Your grandchildren are still kind of young. What kind of pastor would I be? I've said it before, but I didn't tell you the importance of prayer. To bathe your children in prayer. To call upon God. We need the Lord to get our hearts right. So that we're not so consumed with the things of the world. The devil, what the devil is concerned about you being a prayer warrior because you're going to move the hand of God. When you begin to move, touch the heart of God, we will begin to move his hand upon the earth and see, we will begin to see things happening. And so I want to encourage you in your homes and, and with your spouses and to, to pray for the children. But I also want to ask you, I want to plead with you, please keep praying for the church. Please Keep praying for the services. And listen, I know you may not be able to make it all of the times that we have prayer, but please keep coming to prayer time and pray at home. Pray for the church. Pray to God. I've been praying lately. Lord, get, let us let us have an open heaven. I don't even know what that is, but I've heard that a guy talk about that before. And, and he preached under an open heaven. Oh, man. He preached under an open heaven and a fire of God fell and miracles and signs and wonders and salvation and souls won into the kingdom. It's about the presence of God. It's not the oracle abilities of a man. It's not the charisma of a man. It's about the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit moving in the midst of our, in our services, in our lives. And amen, and, and, and the anointing filling us up and us bringing that with us, amen. And so with that said, about two weeks ago, I started praying. Look, the prayers have been, we've been praying. But about two weeks ago, my prayers shifted even into another, you won't call it another dimension, from another angle. I've been praying. I'm like, Lord, please, at first the prayers start off. Lord, pour out your spirit. Then when he starts pouring out his spirit, it's like, okay, Lord, what are you doing? What's going on? I'm like, did you ask me to pour out my spirit? I'm like, yeah, but I feel something different in my spirit. He's like, yes, because I'm about to pour out my spirit upon the land. I'm about to, you're going to hear my spirit moving here three weeks before Asbury. You're going to see this. You're going to see that. What I'm, what I'm feeling my spirit is this. I told Solomon that. I told, I told his uh, buddy Tony that. I told the waiter that served us at Cracker Barrel. 
In my prayer, the Lord is showing me that the days are going to get darker, but he's about to pour out his spirit. A line's going to be drawn in the sand, and people are going to have to make a choice on whether or not they're going to serve Jesus. Yeah. So he's pouring out his spirit because he's pre it's preparation. And I believe we have not even seen the real beginnings of what we're going to experience. I'm, tell, I'm talking about the church. I'm talking about the body of Christ. I believe with everything that is in me. That what, what Brother Solomon said to, to that Sunday, I don't know if you go back and you listen to it, but that it's like, what? Now, it doesn't surprise me. I'm telling you, it doesn't surprise me because God is about to bring in a harvest. We are living in the last days, church. This is no more just a little, oh, hunky-dory little message. Oh, yeah, we're in the last days. Paul thought we were in the last days. No, the days are growing dark. dark. Your love for this world better be waxing dim. What are you talking about? I'm hoping you got a dimmer on your love for the world, and I hope you're about to brighten up your zeal for the Lord, your love for God, because listen, this world ain't got nothing for you, friend. Nope. Full of wickedness. But anyway, about two weeks ago, my prayer life started kind of changing. I started realizing, I, you know, as I pray, I'm noticing something. I'm noticing that the Lord will start to prompt my spirit to start praying for something specific. And then when he prompts my spirit and I start praying that way, look at these old veterans over there like, yep, not time. <laughs> Hallelujah, I'm catching it, sister. As he starts prompting my spirit, and, uh, and, uh, and I mean, I'm, I'm talking about, I'm, I'm catching how he's speaking to us. <laughs> but, but, uh, but as he prompts my spirit, as I begin to pray, the way he's prompting my spirit, guess what's happening? He starts answering my prayers. He starts answering the prayers. Oh, it's such a beautiful, it's a, it's a bad word to use, network. It's such a beautiful commu communion. It's such a beautiful koinonia. Koinonia in the Greek, joint participant. A beautiful joint participation that the Holy Spirit is, it has relationship with us based upon the sacrifice of Jesus where he clothes me in his righteousness and now I can access the Spirit of God and I can commune with him and he communes with me and he'll start to stimulate my spirit. And as I begin to pray, he comes in the answer. So about two weeks ago, I'm like, okay, but Lord, now he starts to, I'm like, all right, Lord. I'm starting to realize that the word you gave me in the barroom bathroom 20 years ago wasn't just about what I thought it was. You will lay your life down before me. You will present my word for the way that it's written, and I will use you. And so the immediate fulfillment of that, I believe, had to do with understanding the message of the cross. Because I was like a fish out of water floundering and flopping around in my Christianity and had no solidarity to my walk. And so that was a huge part that changed. But I believe that what the Lord started to show me was, was that really, and I shared it with somebody, for such a time as this. And listen, that's a scripture that I think has been ringing in a lot of people's hearts. For such a time as this. If you don't know your word, then that doesn't necessarily mean a whole lot. But good news is this, is I'm going to help you out a little bit. Queen Esther, beautiful queen. Amen. Uh, she 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 was married. She ended up marrying the king of Persia, amen. And, and there were regulations. And see what was happening was she was a Jew, and her co her cousin Mordecai told her not to reveal to the people that she was of her heritage, of her Jewish heritage. And she became she was she had gained great favor in the eyes of the king. But there was a wicked man named Haman, and he wanted to destroy the Jewish people because her cousin Mordecai refused to bow to him. See, just as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, just as Daniel refused to bow to the Babylonian Empire and also the Persian Empire, so did Mordecai. He refused to bow to Haman, who was elevated in the kingdom. And like, no, I'm not bowing to you because see, we Jews, we don't bow to men. We only bow bow to God. And so Mordecai wanted to kill him. And what ended up happening is, is that word, well, um, Morde no, I'm sorry, Haman wanted to kill the Jewish people. And Mordecai got word to Esther and he ended up telling her, listen, you, you know, you need to do something. You need to go in the presence of the king, but you couldn't just go into the presence of the king, even if you were the queen, unless you were summoned to go into the presence of the king. And so I, you know, I'll kind of shoot from the hip here, but when it's all said and done, she, he began to realize in her in his conversation with her, and then she began to realize where this concept came for such a time 
as this. You were prepared, Esther. You were positioned, Esther, for such a time as this. Now, that's a big thing for me to sit here and to tell you. But when I tell you, when I look you in the eyeballs, I feel with everything in my spirit that we are here for such a time as this. Amen. Amen. I believe that that's our church. And I believe that God has been doing preparation work in me for such a time as this. And then he's been, pre and pre he's been preparing. Listen, the whole thing with Sue, I'm telling you, that's a big deal. Me and Sue got this major connection going on over here because this was a, I'm telling you right now, this was a miracle of God. Yeah. I'm telling you right now, this was a miracle of God in more than one way. And people can try to say whatever they want, but I know enough about medicine to know that this was a miracle of God. And, and, and I also know enough, of, I know what I'm saying this, now I know enough about the glory of God to say that this was a miracle of God because I experienced it for myself in the room. I felt something in New Iberia, but what I felt in Thibodeau, she, look, you see it, she knows, I know, because that atmosphere in that room that changed, and there was very little of Matt Abair involved in this thing, and it was the Lord, and that's what it's going to be like, church. That's what it's going to be like. As the days grow darker and the Lord starts pouring his spirit out, that's what it's going to be like for you and I as he begins to mobilize his army. There's going to be very little of intervention needed from us. He's just going to be looking for conduits for vessels that are willing to be used by him to allow his spirit to to be poured out, poured in, to be poured through, amen. He's looking for people that would be willing to be used by him, to believe that he's a healing God, to believe that he's a delivering God, to believe that he's a saving God, hallelujah. He wants to impart us with the power that we would be able to walk in. And so, listen, I'm not going to repeat the story all over again, but let me just say this. I'm not going to remind you of how I am and all this because I could sit here for 30 minutes and tell you the story. It all started eight days prior with Gowdy telling me that, asking me to go preach at this church in Broussard. There was a relatively small number of people there and uh, I preached, you know, a message, whatever the case. The next Two days later, the pastor reached out to me while I talked to him on the phone, and then he put me in a group text with another gentleman. And if you don't know me, I'm just not the kind of guy that's chasing around looking for stuff. I'm not a name dropper guy. Uh, I know I'm not interested. It, it, it's, not, it's not that I'm not interested in other men or you know important people. I'm just that just doesn't move me. Jesus moves me. Him, him alone. I don't want to get caught up in all that. It's silliness. Like I don't. I can care less. Like, I mean, no, I do care, but I don't care. I'm not enough to focus on Jesus. I got to focus on yeah. Jesus. Whether I'm a pastor, whether I'm not, I got to focus on Jesus because he's the darling of heaven. He's the lover of my soul. He died for me, and he's the one that's given me life, and I need to focus on Jesus. But nevertheless, I felt compelled. So the whole meeting ends up is going to be a cracker barrel. For some reason, I got prayer, and I, need, I felt like I needed to bring Brennan in. I never brought Brendan out of town with me before. I mean, I don't remember. I mean, I'm not that I wouldn't, but I just was wanting to hurry up, go meet these people, give them, like, touch them a little bit, give them some of my zeal. <laughs> Dude, I felt like about that big when I left that meeting after the experience and that man's anointing. Anyway, I get over there. I start talking about Jesus. Brendan sits down next to Solomon. I tell the waiter, and I, and I really wasn't doing it pridefully, because I, I could see myself doing that kind of thing, where I'm like, I'm going to show them how you're supposed to do it. It wasn't like that. i just been on fire for telling people about Jesus lately, and I told that, <laughs> I told the wait, waiter, I said, hey, buddy, has anybody ever told you how much Jesus loves you? Anybody? I said, well, look, I'm just telling you, I'm a pastor, I've been in prayer, and the Lord's been telling me the days are dark. Would you agree with that, that the days are dark? Mm -hmm. He's like, oh, yeah, that's pretty bad. Yeah. And I said, okay, well, they're going to get darker. But the Lord is telling me, he's going to pour his spirit out. And there's going to be a line drawn in the sand. This is my new little thing. I did it at the Mardi Gras parade. That was my little thing. And I said, there's going to be a choice to be made. I just don't want you to go another day without somebody telling you, Jesus loves you. And he died for your, he died for your sins. So, so now you've been told. And so when the time is right, you'll have that. You'll have it tucked away in your head. And please, when it happens, Right. right, and so that was something like that, right, Brendan? Something like that, kind of sort of. And so, anyway, with that, that, that happened, and, and 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 I don't even know what else happened. I'm all loud mouth like I am, and all of a sudden, Solomon says, 
I appreciate the zeal, man of God, but I, my attention is diverted to this young man. He begins to give him a word, and the word, first word that came out of that brother's mouth was I was like, I, I was just like, wow. Okay, but anyway, that, that the wow didn't stop for the majority of the time that we were there. And at some point in time, I, then I realized he was a world evangelist. And I just went ahead and took a little shot in the dark. I'm like, where are you preaching tomorrow, man? <laughs> He's like, uh, I'm not preaching anywhere. I'm like, well, would you like to preach at the church? And So anyway, you, you know the rest of that story. But on the way home, I don't even know if I told you this, Brendan. I don't think maybe we did. I know we did a lot of talk and we talked a lot about the guy's anointing and the power of how, how articulate the word was. And I said, man, just think he's coming to preach it to the church. He's coming to the church. Praise God, dude. The people are going to be blessed with this ministry. And I said, man, look at, look at that word he gave you, Brendan. I was excited for Brendan, man. Now, you know, and one thing I was like, I asked him, I, and I said this, and he might have misunderstood me because I ain't about all this. Now, he didn't act like he was upset with it, but I said, would you please, before we leave, pray for me? And that's what I, I, all I asked for was prayer because I just wanted him to lay his hands on me and to pray for me. That's all I really wanted. And I ain't going, I ain't begging. I'm just like, no, I need to, I, I just at least need you to pray for me if I'm over here like, all right. So when he comes out there, he's like, he's like, he's like, I'm going to, I think the Lord's going to have a word for you, but I'm just going to pray for you right now. Well, let me just be clear on something. I didn't ask for a word. I didn't say that to him, obviously. I didn't ask for a word. I just asked you to pray for me. But I said, okay. And so he prayed for me. And then we left. And I told Brendan, I'm like, wow, dude, the Lord blessed you. I was, I was so excited for Brendan because it was spot on. I was excited for my brother. I didn't feel any envy, no jealousy at all. I don't search for words. I don't look around for them. You know, one of the things that blessed me about the service, too, is I, could, I, I got a glimpse of Naya standing up in the back. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And you can listen to the video. She's back there. Oh, the Lord, he didn't give her a word. She got a revelation that other people in the body of Christ were being ministered to and being blessed. And she was excited. And I prefer your brother over yourself. Amen. And, and, and so sometimes, though, you know what Jesus said? We've got to be careful. Jesus did say this. A wicked and an adulterous generation seeks after us. Right. At the same time, signs and wonders will follow them. Amen. So let's find our right balance. Amen. And let's find our right. We want signs and wonders. We want the moving and operation of the Holy Spirit in our services. We want the Lord to show up. Amen. And he has he has been, right? And so all this time I'm like, man, praise God. God's gonna bless the people. Well, I couldn't sleep Saturday night. And so my new little thing is, is that if, I, if I'm at home and I can't sleep and I need to pray, I walk to the Morgan City High Stadium and I climb up at the top and I watch the clouds rush across the sky. So about 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm up there praying. And I was like, man, it's so great that the Lord ministered to Brendan and that he's come and ministered to the church. Praise God. And I can, I can feel it. It ain't even all about that. So there's something else. Going down, and I started to feel it in my spirit that this was a divine appointment, unlike I had ever seen before. It's like this networking of something happening in answer to prayer as he prompted my spirit to begin to pray and to ask what was the word in the barroom bathroom really about. And then it's like he comes over here and the word. The word was get. I would almost say if it wasn't me we were talking about, because I'm very weird about that kind of thing to say. If it wasn't me we were talking about, it was almost like Samuel coming to Bethlehem. That, you understand what I'm talking about? The story. Y'all don't know the story. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. No, I will because it's one of my favorite stories. Some people are like, oh, here we go. He done told this story 15 times. It's whenever the, the Lord told Samuel, the prophet, he said, for how long will you mourn for Saul? Seeing that I have rejected him, rise up, fill your horn with oil, and I will send you to one of Jesse's boys, and you will anoint him to be my king. Don't you look at his outward appearance. Don't you look at his stature. For man looks at the outward appearance, but I look at the heart. And he goes through the whole process, and then we get to the last one. There ain't no more. Yeah, there's one. He's just a little runt, though, and he's in the he's in the field, and they call for David. And what I'm trying to tell you is that was a big 
deal. Bethlehem was a little bitty town, and the prophet Samuel showed up. Samuel had to ask the Lord. He said, what am I going to do if I show up over here? They're going to know something's up. They're going to know you're up to something, God. Saul's going to get angry. He's like, go over there and tell me just bring him a sacrifice. He pours that hot oil, that warm oil on David's head. What I'm trying to tell you is that's what it was like in the sense, not me being David, but in the sense of the, pro the prophet showing up at our little church and that way there. At the same time, some of the words that he spoke were directly connected to things that the Lord had already shown me, but it's about my heart, about things that he had shown me about my life, but it's things that I can't say for myself because that's inappropriate to say. It's the, he didn't know nothing about, he don't know really much about me. I mean, I showed him the picture of the kid raising his hands whenever we walked through the Mardi Gras parade. But that's all, that's all he knew about me. And, and, and so, Praise God. But you know what? Is, the main point that I want to make is, is that it was really just an answer to prayer. It was really just a confirmation. So I'm not trying to get all. I'm excited. Okay. And it's now the rest is up to God. But you know, this is another thing. Just this may encourage you. Another thing that, and I shared this with Brendan Kirk the other night, and maybe Pam was here, but I don't mean to do a weird illustration, but it's kind of like, y'all remember the, the old story of Hansel and Gretel? Okay. This is kind of like the illustration that I feel like the Lord's showing me. It's kind of like moving towards the miracle of God, moving towards the promises of God. It's almost like you got to walk to that crumb that you see right there in front of you. There it is right there. I see it. Look at that. It's a crumb right here. And I pick it up. He's, he's moving me in a certain direction to believe him for something. And when I pick it up and my eyes move forward, look at that little crumb over there. That's right. And it's like, and I keep moving in faith to the next little step. And as I move in faith to, in obedience, faith in obedience, and I pick that next one up, it's like, oh, look at that over there. There's another one. And it's leading me somewhere that he's trying. But if I'm not obedient to the first one, I can't be obedient to the second one. And if I'm not, yeah, you get the point. And so that is the process of moving forward in the faith. And I think that that's even the process. I'm not even operating in the prophetic like I want to, but if I drive with Bill tonight, I mean, like what I mean is this, is that I'm like, Lord, I felt like the Lord spoke to my heart. He said, listen, whenever I start to give you some words, I'm probably going to start off with a scripture. I felt like he told me that. So whenever y'all were up here, I was praying. I think I, gave, I, gave, I said something to, uh, to, to Corey, okay? And I felt like the Lord gave me Jeremiah 29, 11 for Corey. And then there was a little word at the end of it. And I felt like he gave me Hosea 4, 6 for Bill. It's in my message. And that's why I kind of like, uh, and, and I tried to move forward looking for another scripture. And he got no, Hosea 4, 6. Well, that's kind of strange because it says, it says um, my people perish for lack of knowledge. And because you have rejected knowledge, I'll reject you. Well, I can't say that to Bill. It's like, no, it's not what you're going to say to Bill because Bill has not rejected my knowledge. Bill has embraced my knowledge. Bill has accepted my knowledge. Bill is eating my knowledge. And he's not going to perish. He's accepted. Amen. And so that's the word that the Lord had me share with Bill. So these are just early steps in it. But you know what? I'm going to believe God. This is the thing. If they walk in here with their blind eyes, guess what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk over there and say, hey, let's pray for the one with blind eyes. And guess what? Open them up, close them. Can you see that? No? Well, guess what? Let's pray again. And we'll pray a few times, and if we don't get it right now, well, you coming back next week? Good, because we got to keep on praying. Because it's not my responsibility to heal anybody. It's my responsibility to believe that God is a healer and to believe that God has the power to heal, to deliver, to set free. And that's the kind of man of God I want to be. Yes, Amen. Amen. You know, one of the things, though, I noticed, too, is that, man, that brother had a pretty awesome way of uh, ministering, right? And, you know, I was thinking, man, Wow, that was, that was really awesome, you know, in the way that he ministered. And uh, I was thinking, though, you know, the Lord's not going to turn me into a Solomon. I'm sorry for you guys. I'm, not gonna hold it, I'm, I'm so sorry for you. That tomorrow I'm not going to be a Solomon. The Lord don't want me to be a Solomon, man. The Lord called me to be Matt Bear. He's giving me an enhanced version of Matt Bear, And if that's not really, 
You yeah, well, let me be a nice Matt Avery. Look, I'm just trying to say, like, that's that's what he's gonna do. He's gonna make a better yeah. Matt Avery, not gonna make a Solomon, you know? And so, and, and plus, you know what I was thinking? He's already told me, I need you to start working on some prophetic messages. I already got, I've been preaching prophecy, I just don't realize it. When I preach them narrative stories, dude, that's so prophetic. Whenever we start talking about naming and we start talking about Abraham laying wood on the boy's back, you think everybody in the world knows all that? No. And, and, and all kinds, and I've already got, I've already got a list of them that I'm going to work on. But you know what most of the messages are for? Is whenever he does fulfill the promise, I end up in another place and it's time to preach. And he's going to be able to go in the library of these types of messages. But guess what? Tonight, I'm not preaching in a stadium in Costa Rica, my friend. I'm preaching at 113 Lydia Street in Patterson, Louisiana to a church. And I'm a pastor of a church. And we got some stuff that we need to talk about. Amen. Hallelujah. We got some stuff that we need to talk about because if you're of one mind and one accord, what we want is we want the Lord to give us an open heaven, to pour out his spirit, to minister to us, to change us so that he would use us to save others. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, I, he ended up texting me something. And I, obviously, I'm going to be cool about it. But I did text him today. I sent him, I sent, I sent him the same teaching video I sent most of y'all. Sure did. Because let me tell you something. You think a man of God don't need to hear other people oh, preach? Yes. Right. And he's stuck in airports all over the world. You think he don't know. He got all kind of downtime. It would be good for him to click on some anointed living word teaching. It will be a blessing for his soul to receive the truth of the word. Amen. And so I... So, you know, but one of the things he told me was um, he talked about he talked about your the zeal of the Lord. And that was something that that uh, Tony said to, you know, I said, man, I'm sorry. dude. I called him after that afternoon. I was like, I feel like I feel so small. You know, the way I walked in there all loud. I was like, you know, I said, dude, and really I was so humble. Like, brother, you ain't had nothing to apologize. Dude, your zeal. And I mean, he was just encouraging me with that. And then Solomon said it. He said, man, your zeal for the Lord, your love for Jesus is contagious. And I don't believe that he's just saying that kind of thing. I, you know, I don't think he just throws words around. So it was encouraging for me. Look, I'm not a guy I can usually take compliments very well. But praise God, I'm going to receive all of that. Amen? All right. So that was the first thing. But I'll tell you another thing that I was praying too. I think this is, I think that this is really awesome. About three days before this went down to where I met this guy, I started another little element to my prayer changed. I started praying, Lord, I'm asking you to give me the mouth of a prophet, the zeal of an evangelist, the heart of a pastor, and the mind of a teacher. So that's how I prayed it the first day. The second day I prayed it again, and then I added to it, and Lord, I don't even know what that word apostle means. I don't know exactly what's going on with all that, but I know what it, I do know what it, the definition is. It means a sent one. It means an ambassador. So I'm asking you, oh Lord God, to allow me to represent you on this earth. And I mean, was that not amazing too? Like yes. that was another word that kind of like just like came came out of his mouth. Amen. I want to I want to you know with all that said, I want to talk a little bit about the Word of God and about the written word. Amen. Because listen, if we don't have the written word, there's no way for me to be able to look back up to know that I'm actually hearing the living word. And when he's talking about the living word, he's talking about the voice of God. As a matter of fact, let me not read too much off the paper, but let me say this. Let me, let me say this, that the, that the written word was inspired by the Holy Spirit. The written word that lays, the, the letters of ink that lay upon the page, they are just full of life, and they're ready to spring off the page and to bring life to the inside of the heart of man. God from heaven inspired the word of God, and yes, they, they sometimes they might seem like they're stuck on the page, but let a little bit of dew from heaven come down and moisten that word on the page, and it'll spring forth, and it'll enter into your heart, and it will begin to bring life, amen? And so listen, too, without the written word, there's no way for you and I to understand the living word. And, and this is another thing I want to say. You and I, we're, we're talking to people, I'm looking in the crowd, and for the most part, I believe that probably 
most of us are saved. Maybe not. Maybe there's two or three people that. And what I mean by saved is you've never received Christ as your Savior. You, you may believe Jesus was real. You might believe he died on the cross. But you've never accepted his sacrifice for yourself. But for the most part, us in here, I believe that we're probably saved, right? And I believe that a good bit of us are probably filled with the Filled with the, with the Spirit of God. Amen. But look, if we don't understand the Word of God, if we have not put the Word of God on the inside of our hearts, it's very difficult for us to live for the Lord. And listen, I believe God does want to use the prophetic gifts to speak words to us and to help us. But have we been in the Word of God? I got a question for you. I, I just need to know. Have we been in the Word of God? Have we been availing ourselves to what God has already given us? And then, in addition to that, when we read the Word of God, are we obeying the Word of God? Like, that's a big deal. Some people are like, well, we can't obey. Well, of course you can obey. It. It's better to obey than it is for sacrifice. What are you talking about? You can't obey the word of God. Jesus died on the cross and paid the penalty for our sin so that the Holy Spirit could be released so that you and I could walk in victory. But yet, nevertheless, I'm telling you right now, and how do you know so much, preacher? Because I've done it. I have seen the word of God and I have rebelled against the word of God. James said for him that knows to do right and he does not do it for him it is sin. And I just got a question. If we can read the word of God and not obey the word of God, are we surprised that we're no longer hearing the voice of God? Because we really shouldn't be that surprised. I mean, we, we're not even by the grace of God obeying what's written, and, but we want him to speak to us. Uh, we're, we're feeling dry. We're feeling like we're in a desert place. I got, I got an answer for you. One step of obedience. One, one step of obedience. Let me say it again. One move towards obedience can change your life. Yes. One crumb right there. One word from the Lord right there. Where did, you, where did it start going bad, my friend? I'm just asking you a question. Whenever, if you're in a dry, in a, in a dreary land, if, you're in a, if you feel like you're in a desert place, try to think backwards. Go ahead. You know, tonight when you're laying in your bed, close your eyes and try to think backwards. Where did it, where did it start going wrong? And whenever he shows you, take that first step of obedience and reach over there in faith and grab that crumb that's laying there and watch what he will begin to do. Watch what he will begin to do as he begins to moisten your heart, as he begins to minister to your heart, as he begins to put you in a place where he shows you another crumb to go and get. And as you progressively by faith, begin to believe God. Amen. Watch what he will do in your life. I think that that's really important because about what I'm about to say. I have not seen the movie yet. I want to go see the movie. I'm talking about the Greg Locke movie. I didn't really like him that much at first. I'm going to be honest. And the reason why was because I'm going to say it later. On the first, one, day I was, one day I was exposed to COVID. And I had heard my mom had COVID. And uh, I was trying to prevent peak roofing from getting COVID. I didn't know I had COVID yet, but I knew I was exposed to it. So I went out <laughs> to, a, to a job site and I had a COVID mask on. Do you think I'm scared of COVID? No, I work in a hospital by the grace of God. And anyway, whatever, I'm on film. I didn't take the shot. And, I, and, and, and one of the places I work, they don't make me wear a mask and I don't wear a mask. And one of the things that I'm noticing is, is that the more I'm exposed to it, I'm not saying I can't ever get it again, but by the grace of God, I hadn't got it. I've been around it like crazy. So there's something to natural immunity. Hello. But at the time, hallelujah, because God created simply and wonderfully made our bodies. And we've been living under a spirit of fear. Or they're trying to make us live under a spirit of fear. Let me say it that way. Anyway, I show up at the job site. I got the little mask on. I'm thinking, and I'm trying to be, you know, good little boy. And anyway, Wade had probably come across the guy because at first that was what it was about. It was about the COVID thing. And they, and they sent me this video. And on the video, the dude said, don't you come up in here with no mask on because if you do, we're going to tell you to get out. And I was like, boy, this guy, you know. But anyway, praise God. Uh, nevertheless, now this movie's out, and it's a movie about deliverance, right? And, uh, and I got to tell you that I believe so much. I understand so much better 
about the ministry of deliverance. Amen. And, uh, and so look, but you know, I want to say this. I'm preaching to a church of blood bought, spirit filled yes. Christians. Yes. <laughs> Our services ought to not be looking right now like the trailer on that movie looked. Our services ought to not be looking like that, my friend. Now, if the place explodes anytime soon, he did use the word accelerate. If the place explodes anytime soon and we got to buy a tent to put in the field right there yep. and y'all yep. start going out to Walmart and at the workplace and I start bringing them in from the job and the tent's filled up with a bunch of people that don't know the Lord, I'd imagine from time to time some of our services might look like a snake's nest. That's right. You understand what I'm saying? But it ain't supposed to be looking like that right now. It, it, and it certainly shouldn't be looking like, like that where the same people every other week are having to be delivered. No, 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 no. What it, what it should look like is, is that, is, what about good old biblical Christianity? Well, what you're trying, trying to talk about? I'm talking about the word of the Lord. What about good old biblical Christianity where the, the man of God preaches the word of God and the Holy Spirit brings conviction to the heart of man, and the heart of man repents of his sin. What about that? No, that's that's powerful. Yes, yes. No, that's that's biblical Christianity. Let me tell you something. We, we have gotten so far in the church from what the Word of God says. You, you understand that? Mm -hmm. You know, I was sharing with some people today. I got some people to come from a big church, and they were young, and it's probably a young church. And, and I was trying to share with them. I said, and I tried to explain to them. And I, I don't know what, how they took me. I mean, they were very sweet. They listened to what I had to say. But I said, church has changed so much since I was younger. This nation has changed so much since I was younger. And I get it. The millennials don't understand. But am I supposed to tailor my message to, to entreat millennials because they're not going to understand? Or am I supposed to still be preaching the Bible like, is that how they did it in the book of Acts? That they were, that they were concerned that they were going to upset people that didn't understand the gospel and that they were going to change their methods and that they were going to change what it was that they were doing? Or did they just preach the truth and let the Holy Spirit deal with people's hearts? You know, whenever, I hope that Brendan's still up for it, but whenever Brendan's ready, and I was even thinking about reaching out to you today, but I didn't do it, so I'm not going to ask you to do that. But I, the Lord's been putting it on my heart lately, too, to understand that deliverance ministry really and truly should be a whole lot different for a believer than it is an unbeliever. And it should be a whole lot different for a Bible understanding believer than it is for a person who calls himself a Christian but doesn't really understand it. <coughs> what I'm trying to talk about is this. If you are a child of God, and you have received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And you are filled with the Spirit of God. And you know the Word of God. And the Lord is dealing with your heart about something. The problem may be that you have not repented. See, true repentance doesn't mean, I'm sorry, Lord. That's right. True repentance comes to the realization that I was wrong. I allowed myself to believe a lie. I allowed myself to believe something that was different than what's written in this book. Right That's right. I allowed myself to believe that the spirit of the world was right mm -hmm. and that I was wrong, yep. that God was wrong. Right. <laughs> I allowed myself to believe that it was okay for two men to fall in love or two women to fall in love. That's not what this book says. That's right. I began to believe that that psychology had the answers for my problem because it was too big for God. So it's a medical diagnosis now. God can't do that. No, sometimes the symptomatology of what you're dealing with is a spirit of fear, my friend. Right. And you think God's not big enough? No. Reality of it is, is that sometimes our flesh wants what it wants. That's right. The true word of God says that the flesh must be crucified. That's right. We don't like it for our flesh to be because most of the times that we, that our flesh likes, we like the way it makes us feel. We like it. I don't want to let go of that. 
I don't want to let go of that one thing. It's like a little child with a blink. You ever seen them when they come in there? I work at the clinic. And look, they're blinking. That thing's all dirty. Dude, really. <laughs> dirty. They've been sucking on that thing. <laughs> got just saliva all over it, dude. It's, it smells. It's got dirt on it. They're dragging it around. <laughs> Don't take my blankie. I love my blankie. He made me feel so good. I'm trying to make a point. The point that I'm trying to make is sometimes our flesh yeah. loves certain sure. things and we're unwilling to let it go. That's not a demonic spirit. Oh, there's demonic spirits making me, enticing me to want to hold on to my blankie. But the reality of it is, is that if I'm a blood-bought, spirit-filled Christian and I've been in the Word of God, if I would light my eyes upon His Word, His Holy Word, if I would allow myself to read the Word of God, it's not going to take very long for the Lord to lead me to a passage of Scripture that's going to jump off the page and it's going to minister to my heart and it's going to show me the error of my ways and then now I am faced with a decision. Amen. As a child of God, I am faced with a decision. Will I allow the conviction of the Holy Spirit to deal with me or will I remain in my current state of mind? Will I say, oh, but no, that's not really sin because da 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 You know, I had a young lady that, that I was working with over there and she was part of that little process of when I drank that whole drink. I didn't even get to tell Solomon that part because I didn't tell him the whole story. But whenever I had that, you remember I was doing a fast and I went and bought one of them Hulks. You, you can't use a Hulk when you're fasting. It's got butter pecan ice cream in it, dude. But it turned into something. I took a big old swig off that butter, off that Hulk smoothie. And when I did, my eyes were lightened. Y'all remember that? And immediately I remember the story in the Bible where Jonathan, they, they had called, his daddy had called a fast. And then, and they were getting ready to go to battle. And Jonathan saw that honey and he dipped his stick in there and touched it on his tongue. The Bible says his eyes were lightened. Hallelujah. That honey, that sugar got up in his bloodstream. It's like, whoa. That's like the energy of the Holy Ghost. Whoa. I'm ready for war now, baby. And so I took a swig off that hulk. And man, the, the, you know what I'm saying? The power of God. What? The, the power of the hulk. <laughs> it gave, gave me energy. <laughs> So I walked in the, in the lab where the nurses were, and I told her, hey, man, because I knew that this girl, uh, I'm not going to be preaching my message anyway to tell you. I knew that this girl had, uh, she had moved from North Louisiana. I hope you're watching tonight, girl. You keep going because you're doing so good. I'm so proud of you. She had moved away. I'm going to say it. I mean, they don't know you anyway. You're from North Louisiana. I'm not going to say your name, though. She had moved down from North Louisiana, and along the process, I worked for, with her for about a year, I learned that she had been a believer, she had been serving God in the past, but I knew she wasn't really serving the Lord. There was no question whether she loved the Lord. Let's get that straight too, guys. Let's, yeah. let's clarify something here. Whenever Bill and I went to the little Mardi Gras parade thing, many people told me, I love God, and I can remember one specific lady that I said, man, I don't question for one second whether you love God. You're just not serving him. <laughs> and I know I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just trying to tell you. I know you love him, but you're not serving him. God ain't looking for people to just say, oh, I love you, Lord. And, you know, somebody, I think it was Pat Dillon or somebody was saying the other day, he's not looking for a date. He's not looking for a one-night stand. He's looking for somebody that will marry him. He's looking for somebody that will enter into covenant relationship with him. He's looking for somebody that won't be ashamed of him. He's looking for somebody to be like that woman in the Song of Solomon when he came knocking on her door in chapter 5, but she was in a dream. And she said, who is it? It's, it's, it's your beloved. The Lord's knocking on the door and he's asking to come in. And she said, well, how will I be able to get up? I took my coat off. I washed my feet and I'm laying in the bed. Okay, I'll get up. I'll get up and my hands dripped with myrrh when I turned the knob. But my beloved was gone. He was gone. It was a dream, thank God. She, but she runs through the streets and she's searching for her beloved. She finds her friend. She's like, have you seen my, my beloved? Well, what's the big deal about your beloved? What, what's the big deal here? Yeah, 
Let me go ahead and tell us what's so big a deal about your beloved so that we can maybe think about trying to help you find it. And she's like, oh, my beloved. His mouth is this. His hair looks like this. His eyes look like this. She begins to describe it. You know, it'd be kind of like you at work. And it's like, oh, no, let me tell you. Let me tell you what Jesus did. He forgave this woman. And he was sitting there in this man's house eating, and they were looking at him, and here she comes in there, and she takes all of everything that she had saved all of her life. So I'll talk about that, right? But I was thinking about it later. All of her life, she had been holding on to this thing that was so important for her. It probably had to do, she was probably saving it for her wedding day. She, and, and she was saving it and holding on to it. It was precious. She probably had her whole life and identity wrapped up but after Jesus got a hold of her, she knew what she was supposed to do. She was supposed to break it, and she was supposed to lay it all on her king, right? So that's the kind of love we're talking about. That's the kind of service we're talking about. Whenever nothing else matters. Nothing else matters other than Jesus. I'm about to pour my life out on Jesus. And so that woman in the Song of Solomon, she begins to tell her friends all of this. And then the next thing you know, when you transition this into chapter 6, she, they're like, they're like, help us to find your beloved because we're gonna, we want to help you because we want to find him ourselves. And that's what's really going on, amen, or supposed to be going on. We're not supposed to just say that we love him. We're supposed to have, we're, God wants us to serve him. Amen? And so, <laughs> anyway, she was sitting there, and uh, I knew that she had, the girl at work, had she previously, you know, went to church and was serving God, but I also knew through, you know, that she had a boyfriend, and that she had moved from North Louisiana, and she was, well, let's just say what it was, she was shocked up with her old man. All right? Well, you know, I never did really say anything, but I would talk about the Lord, and after I took a off that, you know, the hit off that Hulk, and my eyes were light, and I went up in that room, and I said, man, y'all ever heard the story, because I knew, and there was another couple of Christians in there, y'all ever heard the story when Jonathan put that honey on his lips, and then, that's crazy, because the next day, Naya preached on that, all right, so anyway, well then, so then that gave me more fuel for the next day, because I worked there on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and Wednesdays in between, I talked about the honey thing, and I have preachers on that, I'm like, wait, I go back Thursday, y'all ain't going to believe what happened at church last night, what you talking about? I'm like, man, y'all remember how I told y'all about that honey, and, and they were like, yeah, I was like, the girl that, that leads worship, the lady that leads worship, she preached. She preached about that honey, that story. And they were like, no, nah, man. I'm like, no, I'm telling you, dude, the Holy Spirit. She preached on that. I said, now check this out what the Lord showed me. I told him the story about David holding the head of Goliath. And I saw her turn around. And I saw her sheepishly looking. The Spirit of God was moving in that room. And they were like, one of the nurses, she's been watching some of the videos. She said, I got to go give shots for Dr. So-and-so. But y'all hold on. I'm going to be right back. And she comes back. And she's like, what did I miss? I'm like, what do you miss, man? David's holding Goliath's head in his hand. He's a victor. J David's a type of Jesus, and he won, he won the victory for us. Yeah. Hallelujah. And, and I almost this close. Yeah. Told her, girl, you need to get your heart right. I did. I just let me go. About three weeks later, I go on a vacation. I come back, and um, hallelujah, I come back, and she says, um, somebody says, did you, know, did you know she's leaving? And I said, what? And I looked, she was right there. I was like, man, she's my, she my sister in the Lord now, man. I'm just like, I mean, not really. I mean, I'm working with all these women and they're and they starting to like love Jesus. And I mean, it's like, it's a pure thing. It's not like a wrong thing. It's like, I'm, I'm seeing people, I'm seeing people's lives get changed. It's exciting. You know, I tell Danielle about it. I'm like, man, I'll tell other people about it. God's moving. Hallelujah. And you know what she tells me? She said, I'm out of God's will, man. This isn't God's will for my life. This is my will. I'm in rebellion. I'm going home and serving Jesus. She said, something's happening on this earth, and it's about to get ugly, and I'm going home because I'm going to serve Jesus. So then she texts me about a week and a half ago, and she says, do you think that antidepressants could mess up your ability to hear the voice of God. I'm like, absolutely. Absolutely. Unequivocally. 
Yes. 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 Wow. Period. Yes. Done deal. Yes. Manipulating your neurotransmitters, changing your mood. Oh, what are you telling me, preacher? Get out of here. No, no, no. You get along with the Lord. But let me tell you something. I'm going to let you know right now. Yes. She said, well, you know, it's kind of crazy because I've been taking antidepressants for a long time. Ten years. Mm -hmm. Ten years. And she said, I've been off of them for a week now. And she said, I just got to the chapter in your book you gave me and you talked about. She said, I'm kind of feeling a little bit rough. I said, that's all right, girl. Look. And so when she texted me, I called her up. And I'm like, let's pray. I was at work. And I'm like, let's go outside right now. We're going to pray. And we're going to trust God. And, and, I, and look, I believe. Look, she's, she's on fire. I believe it, man. She's, sending, she's constantly sending me TikToks. She's the one that said, hey, can you put me on channel two real quick? Uh, if you don't have me on there already. Yeah, some of y'all have already seen this. But uh, I want to show you this because I plan on putting it in one of my messages. And after this, we actually get, I'm going to let the singers and the musicians come up after this. Basically, what I wanted to talk to you about was the Word of God and the aspect of the Word of God that um, I probably have to dig around for this thing, I guess. I got to try to figure out. Oh, look here. Yes. All right. So, um, so I really wanted to just talk to you about the Word of God and the idea of repentance and true biblical Christianity and how really deliverance is different. If we have been disobedient to the Word of God and the will of God, what we really need to do is we need to get our hearts right and we need to repent. And let me tell you, repentance is not just me saying, I'm sorry. I want to let you know that repentance is me acknowledging that I have failed the Lord and that now I'm broken over it. And, that I, and listen, a lot of times there's emotion involved with this. And I want to say this, too. Sometimes in the life of believers, we've got to be careful because just because somebody's manifesting emotions doesn't mean that they're manifesting a demon. I'm just trying to make a point. All right. Because listen, it all, things are happening in the soulless realm. And whenever a person truly repents. Sometimes emotionally, it will begin to affect you. And listen, you know, can I be honest with you? And I, you know, I'm just, I'm a, I want to be a transparent guy. Ever since the Lord showed up in our bedroom that night before I went to go get my daughter, I kind of told y'all that story multiple times. I've been in a constant state of repentance. You do whatever you want with that. I remember whenever I first got saved at Twin City, Sister Tut told me, honey, you don't have to keep, no, 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 that's not true. Somebody else in the church told me, you don't have to keep coming up to these altars. She said, she told me, baby, let me tell you something. You ain't got to keep coming to these altars, but anytime you feel you need it, it's a good thing to stay at these altars. And, and that's what I'm trying to tell you. This is what I've noticed. As I enter into this prayer time, and, and I'm able to make this connection with the heart of God. The more, the more I come to prayer, the more I feel the overwhelming presence of the Lord, the more he begins to deal with deeper things, deeper things. And, and, and it, it's just like he's revealing it to me and I'm able to give it to him. And so I just want to encourage you with that. That's, that's what true repentance looks like. I just got to try to give you an idea because sometimes you might feel like you're dry. You feel like these are, listen, and, and listen, if you're going through all of that and you're saying, you know what? I'm in the word. I've repented. I see the word of God now. I'm trying my best because, you know, you're a victorious warrior in Christ. You know that you know that that the devil is not more powerful than you. Do you understand that you have authority over the evil one? That you and I should be walking in victory. Amen. No, that's what the word of God says. Do you believe that about yourself? And if you don't, then guess what? The enemy is trying to get you to buy a lie. The word of God says that you're more than conquerors through Christ who loves you. The word of God says you've been crucified with Christ, your old man that was bound by sin sin and that you've been resurrected to a new man, that you're a new creation, amen, and that you're no longer bound to sin and you're no longer a slave to sin. That's what the word of God says about you. That's what the word of God says about me. And that's why, that's why part of getting into the, into the word of God, listen, I don't need your hands to be raised right now, but I got I to gotta ask you a very serious question. Two questions. Number one, have you really Put the word of God in your heart like you were supposed to. Let me ask that question. 
Have you really put the word of God in your heart like you were supposed to right. as a child of God? And if you feel like you have, have you been obedient mm -hmm. to Good. the things Good. that he's shown you? But I can't. No, no, you can. Yes, you can. You can. Let me tell you why. Because Jesus died. He paid the penalty for sin. There's a release of grace. He's giving you victory over sin. You got to lay your flesh down at the cross. You got to lay your flesh down at the altar. And listen, if you don't, let's just pretend for a second. Let's just pretend, okay, and, and, and if you've done all that, then maybe you have. Maybe you have been lingering around with playing around with sin too long, and maybe a demon spirit has touched the hold of your soul a little bit. Maybe then you need deliverance. Maybe we need to get you over here. Get, call a couple people up. We'll pray over you. We'll cast them devils out. But again, can I break the, the bad, good news with the bad man? Good news is we, we, we get you delivered. Amen? Bad news is if you don't get in the word of God, and you don't start serving the Lord, and you don't start obeying the Lord of God, guess what? It's going to come back seven times worse. Right. It's going to come back seven times worse. Right. So you just soon hold on until you're really, no, not really. That's not true. But the, but the point is the Word of God. Amen? Look, I wanted to show y'all this. Uh, I wanted to show y'all this, this video <laughs> that this young lady sent me that I used to work with. And uh, the moment you woke, you wake up in hell. Now, I'm not trying to pretend that any of you in this place are going to wake up in hell. That's not what I'm trying to say. If you have received Christ Jesus as your Savior, then you ain't got nothing to worry about on this because you're a blood-bought Christian. But after you watch this, this is why we're here on Tuesday nights praying. This is why we're here on Friday nights praying. This is why we're here before church on Wednesday nights. I'm just trying to get your head right, bruh. This is why we're here on Sunday mornings before praying that the Lord would move and that the Spirit of God would begin to move in our services and that we would take Jesus outside the walls of the church because there's a lot of people out there that we're running into and they, they're not saved and they're going to end up waking up in hell. Hopefully it'll work. Oh, Lord, where's the uh, mute? Here we go. And then after this, I want the singers and the musicians to be able to see this. So after it, y'all can come forward. We'll end in a song, okay? The moment you wake up in hell, when you realize the mission of your land, you have damnation and sorrow and burning in hell. Can you imagine what that'll be like? There's somebody to plead with, there's somebody to clap to, there's somebody to go to get help, you're in hell. To lift up your eyes in hell, it's got to be the worst shock that could possibly happen. I'm not dying. You're going to die. You're going to pray yourself some of you for that. You don't even believe it. That's not a shock. The shock is waking up where you don't expect to be. To think that when you die, you die like a dog and it's all over with. You brag, you boast, and you tell people about that. I said, this is it, I'm just a man, I'm just a, I'm just a man, I'm a man, I'm a man, I'm just 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 a man, i am just a you don't have any idea the horror that will shut your soul. Amen. Singers, musicians, we can go ahead and close this out in a song. You know, um, I've talked to doctors before through the years. And I'm like, I'll be talking to them about the Lord. And they're very scientifically minded. And most of them believe in only science. And they believe, you know, uh, they don't believe in an afterlife. Or at least that's what they've convinced themselves of. And I'm like, and as I talk to them, I'm like, well, what do you, what do you think about all that? And I just said, and I'm like, ah, I'm an animal. And whenever I die, just what he was saying, whenever I die, this is going to just be it. We're just, in, we're, just in, we're, just, we're just an animal with a higher intellect than a dog. That's, what, that, that's where he probably got that from. I have literally heard more than one person tell me that in the years that I've been witnessing. And that's sad to me. 
that, that, that should really grip our hearts. If we're sitting there and that didn't touch us at all for other people, I'm not talking about for you to get shaken, although if it shook you, you get on your knees. I'm just trying. It shook me a little bit. It shook me a little bit the first time I watched it. I was like, oops, yeah, it don't feel good. And so, look, let's just worship the Lord. And let's keep remembering that we want to cry out to God to have his way in our hearts and in our lives. Amen.